We have our annual report just came out. If you'd like to pick up a copy, it's in the back in the narthex. And added in addition this year, we have a pictorial section, thanks to our youth group. They did this as a thank you to you for your support of their ministry throughout the year. So please take the time to pick one of these up before you leave today. I always get tickled reading that passage about the wedding banquet. It just, it gives me this image every time of somebody walking up and sitting at the head table. <laughs> just anyone that's been invited. I mean, we all know that the bride and groom and the attendants are all supposed to what if you just walked up and just sat down? <laughs> One of the joys of being in a fraternity, at least my fraternity, were very, well, sort of strict table rules. So at mealtime, there was a head of the table who was responsible to make certain that we had appropriate conversation in mixed company. I don't know what the responsibility was when it was unmixed company. But we'll talk about that. Then there was the foot of the table who was responsible to make sure that everyone's drink was filled and if somebody needed something from the kitchen, they hopped up and ran and got it. The other unwritten rule we all had was that you tried to eat in groups of eight. There were eight chairs at a table, and if there was a female going to be sitting with you, you all had to stand and wait. So it's amazing how much work you would do before mealtime to gather together seven guys so that you could just rush through the line, sit down, and start cramming food in your mouth without being polite. <laughs> Meal time. It's one of those occasions where we work hard to demonstrate our values and our morals and the way in which we relate with each other all gets played out at three times a day around the table. Jesus gives some very practical advice as to the value of humility at mealtime. Jesus offers up that, practically speaking, you would do better to set yourself in a lower station than a higher station. Now, this is very much in an honor and shame culture. That's where he's coming from. We're familiar with this. Honor and shame culture. If you are a person honored, people would like to be around you. Shame the opposite. Very practical implications. If you're going shopping, let's say for a car, or if you're in that day shopping for a donkey or a cart, are you more likely to go shop from someone you think of as honorable? And then if you know someone that has shamed themselves, you might pass them by. So your status in an honor and shame society can have serious implications on your income. And that all gets played out every day around the table and elsewhere. So in this society, where honor and shame, the way we stratify ourselves in society, has serious implication, Jesus uses it as a teaching moment to give some practical advice as to the value of humility. If you will be humble at the table and set yourself farther away from the host, because the host is the most important person at the table, if you seat yourself far enough down and let the host recognize that you're in the wrong spot, they will notice you and bring you up. And then you'll be more honored in front of your friends. But if you're going to be noticed, better be noticed that way than to be the one who's always trying to be the social climber and get closer to the most important person and wiggle yourself up and then be told to go down the pecking order. Now you're noticed the wrong way and you're ashamed. It reminds me of that text where James and John are fighting over who's going to be at the right hand of God and Jesus is just beside himself with their ignorance because it's something they should never have thought about. So this practical advice about humility makes so much sense until Jesus decides to go one step further. So far he's been talking to the guests, right? All of us, guests at the table. When you are a guest, this is a way that a guest behaves well to get yourself noticed well to increase your honor in the social group. Then he turns to the host and he says, now, you that are hosting the meal, you would do well to invite people that cannot repay you. This is not the Godfather movie. I will do this thing for you, and sometime down the road I'll ask a small favor by you, by which I mean actually a large favor from you, because now you will owe me. Jesus has just flipped this on his head and said, now you should start inviting people that can't repay you. 
Don't invite all of your you know, best customers or the person you want to be a client. Don't invite people that could ever owe you or repay you. Jesus says this because that's how the kingdom of God works. Jesus is all about the kingdom of God. How many times do we hear Jesus say when he enters a house, today the kingdom of God has come near you because Jesus is there. Jesus is there. His presence is the kingdom of God in your midst. And Jesus wants that magnified. And what an easy way for us to magnify that than the three times a day when we gather around a table and we have a choice of how we're going to gather around this table and how we're going to organize ourselves and who we're going to invite to sit next to us. We can use that as our simple and very concrete way to show a glimpse of the kingdom of God. When we gather around this table every Sunday, we use it as an opportunity to get a glimpse of the kingdom of God. For we gather around this table where the host has provided it for us, and there is no closer or farther away. It's just the joy to be around the table. It's like the Last Supper where Jesus gets up to wash the feet of his disciples. He doesn't just wash the feet of the person closest to him and then hand the rag over. That would have been a fun social experiment. Now, you wash the feet of the person next to you and next to you. Jesus washes the feet of every single person around the table because that's how the host works in the kingdom of God. But it's not just around this table, is it? You've been watching a loop of tables coming up. Tables that we gather around daily. Do you remember your school cafeteria? Unless the seats were assigned by, by class or alphabet, how did they get chosen? How did you know where to sit? And most of us knew where to sit, right? There was a table for the college bound group. There was a table for the sports group. There was a table for the group that didn't know where they were going. They just showed up. Right? We have so many ways to stratify ourselves, to differentiate ourselves, to decide what the pecking order is. Whether it's the shoes on our feet, the book in our hand, or the ball we kick down the field. We have numbers of ways in which we can make a difference between one of us and the other of us. And Jesus in this text is pushing us, pushing us to do something different. You don't have to be the host of the table to do that thing differently. You can simply reach out to someone that's sitting by themselves and pull them in to your table. Whether your table is at the school cafeteria like this, or the boardrooms that you've seen come up, or the communion table. So many are the tables that we gather around. Tables that are concrete and tables that are symbolic in our lives. And we have this chance to so concretely and quickly give someone else a glimpse of the kingdom that we seek and the one that we serve. Thanks be to God that love can be so simple. Amen. I forgot to look to see who's praying for us today. Am I praying today? I get to pray today. Thanks, Jeff. I'm going to pray today. I'm going to help us close with the Lord's Prayer and then our elder will have our offering statement. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day, this chance to worship you with our brothers and sisters of faith, that you call your children together around your table, and you hear our praise and our thanksgiving. We pray, dear God, that not only would you hear our worship, but that you would also hear the groaning of our souls as we lift up to you the names of those that we worry about, ourselves and those dear to us, our brothers and sisters across the globe this supper. And we pray that not only will you hear us, but that your spirit will move among us and that you will inspire us to be your witnesses to the great hope and the good news that has called us into this place. We pray all this, dear God, asking that you will also hear us share the prayer that your Son taught us. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 